It's good to be here at the storehouse um, this morning. Got a lot of things going on this week and coming up. So a lot of announcements I want to give you guys this morning. <clears throat> Announced this last week, the directory. We'd like to get that directory put together, the church directory. So if you guys want to be in it, uh, see Rachel or Tracy. See Rachel for the picture. I'd like to get that done, finalized kind of today, then we'll get it out. So if you want to be part of that. Um, there's some forms, I believe, out here on the side you can fill out. So put it in as much information or as as least as you want on that and just give it to Tracy or Rachel or jump it in the offering box um, to the side. So, hey, also just remember to keep us in prayer. <clears throat> we got uh, me, Ramona, Jim, and I believe Tracy's going, us four going into the jail, the county jail this afternoon at 3 o'clock. So we have the, the service from 3 to 4. Uh, we have the ladies block uh, this afternoon. So I'm excited about just speaking to them. And so just keep that in your prayer as we share Christ uh, and it's through his word uh, to the ladies this afternoon at the jail. Um, this is, to me, probably one of the most important announcements just because of the relationship I have with this gentleman. Um, Clark Robinson, uh, for you guys that have been here in the past, he has uh, graciously come and he's taught a couple classes on Sunday evenings with us. Look, uh, He did a leadership class, six-week leadership class. Prior to that, he did a 12-week kind of a dying to self class, what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> but he's going to be back with us tonight um, from 5.30 to 6.30. He's a respecter of time. He usually cuts right at 6.30. You're going to want to be here for that. If you guys don't know Clark Robinson, he's mid-70s. Um, he's a man of faith, a strong man, full of wisdom and grace. Um, he used to be a trainer of missionaries. Um, he's a great guy to sit underneath. He's a great guy to talk with and just run things by. <clears throat> he definitely loves the Lord and the Spirit of God's in him, and he, he's a great teacher. Um, so I'd encourage you guys uh, to come out for that tonight. It's one hour, 5.30 to 6.30. He's doing an eight-week series uh, that he's titling, um, it's called The Winds of Adversity, uh, The Trials Believers Face as We Make Our Way Home. Winds of Adversity is what he's going to be talking about tonight. And because of that class, um, Jocelyn's Young Ladies class that meets here is going to be bumped back um, a half hour starting at 7 o'clock. That will be tonight, 7 to about 8.30ish. So you, a young lady has been coming to Jocelyn's class. That will actually start uh, tonight um, at 7 uh, p.m., uh, the second and fourth Saturdays of the month, you guys know that we go up to Noah's house um, up in Chambersburg and Candlehart in Chambersburg. Um, and Noah's house is the men's group there that we have fellowship there with them and just breakfast. Um, and then Candlehart, uh, the ladies uh, will meet and go into Candlehart and have breakfast. Both of them start at 8 o'clock and run until about 9.30 or 10. So if you guys are interested in that, for Candlehart, you want to see Julie or maybe Tracy. And for Noah's house, for the breakfast, you can see me or Jim um, about this coming Saturday. So we do that the second and fourth. Um, a Saturday of the month. Um, th this has kind of come up. I've had this question um, for you. some of the new faces. Uh, they've been at, you, we don't pass the plate here. <laughs> um, we have offering boxes here in the back, and we believe that's just an act of worship between you and the Lord. And so people have asked where we give our money at. Uh, we want your money, so um, throw it in the box. That's between you and the Lord. Um, and that covers the things that goes on here, obviously. But that's just uh, something we do um, here. Um, Last but not least, a couple of prayer requests. Um, pray for Liz's husband, Robert, just going through some health things right now. I just lift him up um, in prayer. And I saved him for last, so you see. Um, I'm just going to mention it. Uh, my son does not want it mentioned. He does not, actually doesn't even know. I'm just going to ask you to pray for Caleb. Um, you know, you, if you guys have been following him on Facebook and what he's been doing, um, he got invited to the national track and field meet. Um, he'll be competing this Thursday down in, in IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida. So he's coming in to, with his event 16th in the nation right now. So that's just me being a dad that's proud. He hates probably, I already tell him I'm going to get talked to afterwards. Um, <clears throat> but that's why I think he's been successful. He's been very humble. He's worked hard. So I just ask you guys to pray for him. Um, really, it's just about uh, his athletic success being a platform uh, that he uses to share Christ with people. So uh, that's what we're looking for, um, hoping for a top eight finish, which would make him All-American. Um, so that's what uh, I'm just going to raise that. Uh, yeah, he's looking pretty just staring me down right now. But yeah, just keep Caleb in your prayers. He throws Thursday at 3.30 p.m. down in Bradenton, Florida, down at the IMG Academy. So um, for the rest of us, John 17. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to John 17. That section that we're going to get to um, is going to actually be on the screen. Um, I have it in the English Standard Version, so if you guys are going to follow along in your Bibles in another version, it might be off just a little bit, but I'm going to have it in the ESV. Uh, this morning we're continuing our study, the series that I've uh, titled Our Identity uh, in Christ. 
we're in this sixth point or this sixth mark of what it looks like to be um, in Christ, and we're actually in the fourth part of this, the idea of having the body of Christ, who the body of Christ is. Um, and so we're going to talk about that this morning and then uh, kind of conclude uh, on this sixth point, the body of Christ, next Sunday, Lord willing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can sit here, Lord, with that new identity that you have given us, that we um, know you now, Lord, that we now are called your children. Uh, we've, you've given us an identity as we're abiding in Christ, and uh, now we're part of your body. Lord, help us to see the importance of that and uh, the, really the responsibility, Lord, we have as being part of of your body, knowing, Lord, that you are the head who directs and equips and, and gives gifts to us, Lord, to accomplish the things that you're asking us here as this local body, the storehouse, uh, to do in our community. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask you to speak to us by it and by the power of your spirit. Um, in Jesus' name. So we've looked at a couple points of this body of Christ, um, this idea that Jesus is building a church. Matthew 16, we looked at that section where Jesus said he's building his church. We see it played out in Acts 2. Uh, where the church then is, is birthed there from the preaching of Peter. Um, then we talked about leadership, that second point of the body of Christ, the importance of godly leadership within uh, the body. And primarily, I, I spoke to the eldership here, you know, me and Jim and Stephen, the importance of having godly leaders, godly eldership, people that are worthy to be followed because we're following Christ as being examples. Um, and the, not last Sunday, because that was Mother's Day, the two Sundays ago, the third point we talked about was this idea of uh, growing up into the head, you know, that our pursuit is Christ first and then ministry second. We spent some time looking at the account in Luke chapter 10 of the story of Mary and Martha, where Jesus was in the home of Mary and Martha. And, and, and remember, Martha was so busy about ministry, so busy about doing things in the kitchen, so to speak, um, and she got a little frustrated and she come and really challenged Mary's position and was speaking to Christ you know, about getting Mary to help her. And Jesus noted that Mary actually uh, found the better part, he said, sitting at his feet, taking Christ in, and the importance of the body of us actually doing that, sitting at Christ's feet. And so our, our verse that we've been looking at is 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, the beginning of 10. We spent some time looking at 9 through 12, but uh, we're looking at 10 now, where Peter tells us, once you had no identity uh, as a people, now you are God's people. You had, we had no identity as people, but now we are um, God's people. Now, as we, we're going to go down through John 17, and we're going to be looking at this prayer uh, that Jesus said just prior to being arrested. You know, we wanna, I wanna, what I want to address this morning is, you know, what does it look like to be God's people? What is this identity that we're talking about, you know, as being part of the body of Christ? What does it look like to be part um, of his people? <clears throat> and first, we have to be connected to Christ because he is the head of of his church, which is the body, and Ephesians tells that. We've spent a significant amount of time looking uh, in Ephesians, specifically uh, chapter 4, uh, but in Ephesians, Paul tells us in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, that God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere um, with Himself. And so this morning I want to talk about this idea of body growth, or as we're growing um, as his body. And in this, as I spent time just kind of looking at uh, that section in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 32, really uh, you, you see a perfect church being uh, talked about in those 32 verses. You know, the gifts that Christ gives to the church, and then from that, this gifts he specifically talks about in verse 11 down, down through the 12, um, the, the pastors, teachers, or the shepherds, teachers, he says, for the equipping of the saints. Uh, for the work of ministry, and the end result that Paul is looking for there is that we all mature um, and grow in uh, to Christ, who um, is the head. Uh, but so what we're going to look at this morning is this idea of unity, diversity, love, and then ultimately it's going to be maturity. There's going to be the end of that when we are doing those three things. Obviously, diversity is something. You know, if we look around the <laughs> the room this morning, we're all diverse. We all kind of think differently, so to speak. Um, but when we're united in Christ, and we're going to get into some of the sections of 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, uh, there's, there's this idea of unity, but there's a diversity of gifts that Christ gives to the church for the edification or for the building up um, of the church. So as I was thinking about that, um, I, I was really just focused on John 17. 
I was looking at this prayer. You know, there's a lot of great prayers. Um, if you read through the Bible, uh, you know, Moses gave prayers, Peter gave prayers, you know, David praying. We get these great prayers in the Bible, but I don't believe there's not a greater prepare, prayer in all the Bible than the prayer that Jesus prays here um, just prior um, to being arrested. Um, there's 26 verses here. We're going to look at all of them. We're going to go down through them, and we're going to look for um, this idea of unity, diversity, and love ultimately maturing into uh, the body of Christ. And so as we go down through here, um, it's going to be on the screen. Now I've highlighted and bolded some of the areas uh, within this prayer where Jesus talks about as he prays first for himself in this prayer, and then he prays for the really well the 12, but really the 11 he prays for, um, and then he prays for us uh, disciples now that have believed, you know, almost 2,000 years later uh, from their message. But as we go down through this, these are the two things I believe that we see, and I want you guys to see as we go down through this prayer and kind of make note of, like I said, I've highlighted and underlined uh, these places um, down through this prayer uh, where Jesus uh, prays, uh, uh, of, and you see the heart of God here, that he, he is praying that we might have relationship with God. That's the first thing he's talking about, that we have this abiding relationship with him, and he's going he's to define what eternal life looks like in verse 3 of this, but that we're going to look at this idea of relationship with God, and then we're going to look at relationship with one another, part of the body of Christ, this idea of being united together in love as we mature together. That was the heart um, you know, of Christ's prayer uh, prior to him, then moving into the garden, then where he's arrested, and uh, we know kind of the end of the story then, him eventually being crucified for us. And so John chapter 17, starting um, in verse 1. So we're kind of backing up a little bit from what we've been looking at of the church, of the body of Christ, a little over a month before the church was actually born there in Acts um, chapter 2. Jesus says these words. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven um, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. You know, and we've looked at this section a couple times in this series, Our Identity in Christ, uh, specifically this verse 3 here, you know, answering the question, you know, what does eternal life look like? You know, and Jesus just really narrows it down. He just sums it up in this one thing. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and a Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's where eternal life rests, is that, they can just, that we can simply know him. The, the word actually in the Greek is the word gnosko, which means this, this coming to knowledge of, you're growing into a relationship with. It means you know, an intimate, kind of an abiding relationship with God. That is what eternal life is. And it, so we know that as he prays in for the disciples, and ultimately as he's praying for us, that eternal life that he's speaking about starts now. That eternal life, obviously when we think of eternal life, we think of heaven and, and the future, but that eternal life starts now. Now Paul talks about this idea when he writes to the church in Corinth, that we only could dimly see the future. You know, that we, we still live in the flesh, we still live in this fallen world, but that eternal life kind of starts now. We kind of begin to see things now, and that's going to be his prayer, is this idea of this, this gnosko, getting to know God, knowing God through Jesus Christ. See, he doesn't separate God from Christ. You know, in our culture, especially today, most people talk about God. God's not that, most of the time, isn't that uh, controversial type of a, a, a word, I guess. But the moment you bring Jesus into the whole mix, everything changes. Everything changes. Well, nothing changes when Jesus says this prayer, because Jesus knows exactly what he was all about and knows who he is. And so eternal life starts now. It's in knowing the one true God, and it's knowing Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, in verse 6, he changes a little bit. So now he's kind of praying for himself. He's praying you know, that this glory that, that, that God has given him is going to be manifest, is going to be clearly seen. Um, I believe that Christ knowing here just in a little bit that he's going to be arrested because we're going to see another prayer um, in chapter 18 uh, where Jesus realizes and he knows why he came and this idea of, of dying for sinful man, taking on the sin of, of men and, and Christ is just like, Father, man, if, this can, if you can figure out any other way to save people, do that way. And that's my paraphrased version. But he says, nevertheless, your will be done. Not my, but your will 
be done. And so he's praying for himself as he's moving towards that very minute when he was going to be arrested and eventually going to the cross. Now in verse 6, he switches a little bit, and he now prays for, all the way down to verse 19, those 11 guys, those guys that he picked, those apostles or those disciples. So he says this, um, <clears throat> I have manifested, that is, I have openly given, I've uh, shown your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. And so that, that right there you can already see is this idea, those two things I want us to look at as we go down through here, this idea of relationship, that God is creating a body, that God is creating a church, a called out people to be in an abiding relationship with him. That's what Jesus says is, Your, yours they were, and you gave them to me, you, you, you sense relationship there, and they have kept your word, the idea is they're obedient to the very words of God. Matter of fact, Jesus in John 14, just a couple chapters earlier, um, one of the ways to help identify, it's another identifying mark, is if you're really a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. A proof that you love Christ is a heart of obedience. And that's what these guys were all about. And Jesus notes that in his prayer here. They have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know the in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them, and I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. You sense this idea of family here, that Jesus is praying for unity. He's praying for family. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, but they are in the world, for I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you gave, um, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So in the prayer, right there at the end of verse 11 is the first time that Jesus kind of mentions this idea of unity, of praying for unity, of praying to be together, praying to, uh, for people, uh, for this, this body that he is going to develop eventually in Acts 2, but they're going to be together as one because of what Christ has done in their life. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son, referring here to Judas, the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So you sense this idea of unity, of these guys going out together as a family. You see that really uh, in Acts 2, all the way through Acts. These guys united together with one heart, with one purpose. You know, Paul references this idea of one Lord, one baptism, one church, one faith. It's this unity together that Christ is praying for here. Verse 19, and for their sake, now I consecrate, some versions, will, it's the same word as sanctified, and for their sake I cons consecrate or sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I like that in verse 19, it says for their sake. He doesn't say for my sake. He says for their sake. This is the reason why I'm doing this. This is the reason why I am setting them apart. This idea of being sanctified is the idea of simply being set apart. Set apart for holy work, set apart for doing the things that Christ would have us to do. And so he sets himself apart knowing that he's getting ready to go to the cross, ultimately to set them apart and then to set us apart to do the things that he wants us to do as his body. Now, verse 20, the prayer swings again. Because now he's praying. When, when we listen to this, this is a prayer for you and for me. This is a prayer for you and for me. Verse 20, this is what Jesus prays. I do not ask for these only, for these 11 that he's just prayed for. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. You see, and I've said this a couple times up here, <clears throat> if you know Christ, if you're walking in a relationship with Jesus, you should be able to, from where you're sitting right now, and we can't, there's no programs or apps out there to do that, the genealogy as you track your family, we do it from the, the physical kind of, but we should be able to track ourselves back to one of these guys. 
down through the centuries. That's what he's praying for right there. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And so as they went out, they begin to share Christ. We see that in Acts 2. The church is birthed. The, the church begins to grow. They're out preaching Christ. And down through the centuries, that's happened. As they pass the words of Christ to the next person, to the next person, the next person, the church grows, the body of Christ grows. And somewhere along the line, we heard that word that was passed down through the, through the ages. So this is the prayer that he prays for us. Now listen that they may all be one, even the connection to the apostles, that we all may be one in spirit, that we all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, if you think about this, <clears throat> this idea of unity... Um, and ultimately, he's going to, Paul goes on and talks about the idea of love um, as being really the thing that binds us together. What Jesus is saying there is, it, it, just think about that. Th this idea of the Father being united to Christ, the love that the Father has for Christ, the love that Christ has for the Father, should be the very same unity and the very same love that we have with one another. That's what keeps the church together. That's what keeps us from, you know... <clears throat> I'll, be, I'll just be honest with you guys. I, uh, this past week, I think, or two weeks ago, I think it was, I was up in Chambersburg at a meeting, <clears throat> and so I was talking to a pastor up there of a church. It's actually a really pretty decent-sized church. It's an old denominational church. The pastor was kind of just on the side sharing with me some of uh, the struggles, uh, you know, there at the church. And, and to be honest with you, I kind of ruled the person off because I know the denomination. I know they've kind of folded on some doctrinal issues. And just by at large, the headquarters of this church is old denominational church. <clears throat> but I saw the frustration in the heart of this pastor. And I didn't have anything to say. I was just listening, letting the person talk to me. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and so this, this is what was said. This, <laughs> they said, I'm, I'm in a struggle right now because there's, an old, there's a picture in this. And this church is huge. There's a picture in this church that we're trying to move from a wall and to put on another wall to do some kind of a, I don't know, to remodel the church, to do moves. I don't know what the deal was. <clears throat> and they're about ready to split over it. They're angry because of this, you know, this, this picture that they, the person said, they deemed to be a holy work, a holy picture, some picture, a picture. I just, you know, I mean, I don't know what, and it could be an old picture. I mean, I don't know what. And there was a, and the person that looked at me, he, he, they're just like, they don't get it. They don't get it. I didn't really have anything to say. I just kind of smiled and, you know, you know gave him some thoughts, whatever. But when we're not united together in spirit, as Jesus is praying here, because what, the question I think that we should ask ourselves as you look at this prayer, you know, is Jesus' prayer being played out in your life today? Is, it, is that prayer being answered in your life? Or are you operating outside of that prayer. Because here he's praying for unity. That they may be one, be one even as we are one. So the question I think that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, the way that I live my life with my brother or sister. I mean, I mean if you look to your left or your right or before, behind you, in front of you, you look around here, you can ask, am I united in that way? Not on my terms or how I would not, uh, like define unity. Or can, am I united with my brother and my sister like the father is united with the son? That's, a, that's the prayer that he's saying. This is what I want them to be like, even as we are one. There in verse 22. Now, verse 23 says this, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. See, the comparison of, that Jesus has given here, this idea of unity and love within the body of Christ, the model is the unity and love between the Father and the Son. You see, when we're operating like that, pictures on the wall will not matter. I'm telling you, pictures on the wall will not matter. You know, the work, what is, what is the work? Because that's what he says there as he, as he prays for the first set of apostles, so to speak, or these disciples. You know, I came into the world, now I'm coming out of the world, now I'm sending them into the world. I'm not taking them out, I'm sending them into the world to continue the work that I started. And fighting, you know, I'm, I wanted to share some with this person and 
but it's not the only person I've heard that coming out of. Like, that's what's happening in what I would consider modern-day cultural Christian churches. We fight and argue. There's no unity. And we're going to get into what God thinks about disunity. He doesn't like it. That's why he, he, he's praying for unity. This prayer, you know, are we united? Are we united together? You know, when people look at us, do they see Christ in our lives? Now, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also... So this is Christ's desire. This is what he desires in his prayer. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. There's another, that, that verse right there talks about the one thing I'm asking you guys to kind of pay attention to, this idea of relationship, abiding, being with Christ. You know, and from that, the unity is going to come when we're abiding in a relationship with him. To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Verse 25, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known. That's happening today. So that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. You know, one of the things that this gentleman named Clark does when he, and I've known Clark for a number of years now, I've watched his life, he's the real deal. And the first class that he came for the 12 weeks and talked about, um, which let's just be honest with, um, his topic was dying to self. Who wants to hear that? You know, it's like the idea of Philippians 2, thinking of our brother above ourselves, thinking of the next person better than ourselves, you know. Isn't that exactly what Christ is within the prayer here? You know, and then you think of what, you know, Paul says there in Philippians, that Christ humbled himself to the point of death. He gave up his glory, so to speak, to come here and do the work that, God sent him to do this idea of humility that let this mind be in you that's in Christ, Paul tells us. A mind of humility, a mind of thinking of others above ourselves. This work that is continuing, this work of humility, this work of what Christ has done, continuing in the church. And so as we look at this prayer, the question for me as I look at this prayer is simply as this. As I look through these words, I see what Christ desires. I see what he is praying to his heavenly Father for us. Is this prayer true in my life? Am I walking according to this prayer? Is there power? Is the power of this prayer is it being played out in my life? And so when we started this idea of the body of Christ as being one of these identifying marks on us, the first thing I think I remember saying was we were going to talk about job description, so to speak. And that's what we talked a little bit about on, in the section when we talked about leadership. What is the um, expectation from God's Word for me and for Jim and for Stephen, for anyone that steps into leadership? And we, and we spent time talking about that. That leadership, you know, and we've looked at a lot of sections. Hebrews 13, we looked at 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy 3 and Titus and all kinds of different places. 1 Peter 5, you know, where Paul says, you know, follow me as I follow Christ or imitate me. That the leadership in the church, they need to be following Christ. They need to point other people to Jesus. There's this sense of humility and then this idea of the body and all of us collectively together. You know, what is your job description? <clears throat> when I say yours, I'm not separating you and me. I'm not separating you and the eldership. We all have a function. We all have gifts within this body. And when you read that in Ephesians 4, 1 through 32, this idea, I believe it's, you get a sense of almost a perfected, matured church. You see a church operating together in gifts and doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, you know, that, that he gives shepherds, pastors, or teachers in these, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, with the end result being that we grow into the fullness of who Christ is. So I'm not going to go into any kind of detail this morning about what, your job description is, so to speak, what the church and what the storehouse is supposed to be about. It's going to be on the screen. I would encourage, for you, I would encourage you guys to write these sections down and this week spend some time in them. You know, what does gifts, what do these gifts <clears throat> look like? And each one of us, me, all of us, all of us here have a gift or gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us to um, operate within the body of Christ or the church here. I would encourage you to spend some time in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, through 14, and then Romans, those are other places you can look at as well, but um, Romans chapter 12, 1 through 21. And if you look at those two sections there, well, and if you look, think of chapter 13, really, I, I don't think, to be honest with you, I think that when you read 1 Corinthians that 12 through 14, I think you should start with chapter 13 first. Read it before you read 12 and 14. And before you really <clears throat> spend some time in Romans chapter 12, 1 through 21, um, 
spend some time in the first two verses, verses 1 and 2, specifically verse 2, because verse 2 of Romans 12 says this, be transformed, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove out what God's will is. Unless you have been, I'm not talking, conform, it's easy to conform to things, and that's what Paul is warning us against really when he writes that. Being conformed to the things of the world, doing the world's patterns, they will suck you in. You know, 1 John 2 tells us that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they're not of the Father, but of the world. They're the things that will draw us away. If you've not been transformed by God's Spirit, who cares what gifts come later? Because you, you're not going to be operating in them. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, now he's going to lay out giftings, this idea of diversity in the body, but all of us having gifts or gifts to make the body function the way it should. Um, Love being the main one, faith, hope, and love. He talks about love being the primary one. Matter of fact, Paul's pretty hard, and he says, you know what? If you're doing great ministry works, doing a lot of things for Christ, but you don't have love, my paraphrased version is simply says, all that you do is worthless. has no power. Love is, that's why you should spend time, in, uh, and Clark talks about this often. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. We love to read that section of verses at weddings. Love is patient, love is kind, and you go through that. But he's speaking within the gifts that is given to the church, showing us what love looks like. You know, and what I always say, and I know you guys know this, it's not something I've created, obviously, but if you put your name in there where love is, John is patient, John is kind, John, and you go through that list, can I, like, amen that statement? Can I agree with that statement? And if we can't agree with it, then we might as well just spend some time in verses 4 through 7 before we go talk about chapters 12 and 14 and then move into Romans 12 of what the gifts look like, what the body looks like operating. And ultimately what it is, is Jesus makes his prayer, says his prayer here, this idea of praying for unity, togetherness. And it's not just simply coming together. Um, it, it's, it's the kind of unity that he prays that is between the Father and the Son. That kind of unity, that kind of love between the Father and the Son. See, unity, who here knows that unity and uniformity are two different things? Unity and uniformity are two completely different things. You know, as I was, I was thinking about this, I was trying to think of an illustration. And so forgive me, it's kind of a, maybe, a, I don't know, maybe it's not a good one. But So I was thinking of this, I don't know why this popped into my mind. So most of you guys know, I retired from the sheriff's office. I was a cop for a long time, almost 17 years. Retired from Frederick about three and a half years ago. And one of the things that I did, because I had military service before that, I was on the honor guard team. I loved the honor guard. That was just what I was about. Uh, Tracy, I don't know, Tracy's not here. She used to say I was crazy. Um, actually, she used to use the term that we have 10 codes in, the mil in, the, in law enforcement, 10 series codes. The ten, there's a 1096, which means if you got dispatched to that, you were getting dispatched to a person unstable. And that's how the code went out. And so she would say, always say, you're 1096 over the honor guard. <laughs> that's just how I was. I was so I was 1096. And mainly it was because, you know, just because I came out, I spent 11 years in the military. I was about, you know, looking right and, you know, making sure my uniform, you know, we wore, for the honor guard team, we wore, you know, uniform with Clarino types of uh, a glow, high gloss, and made sure my, well, I've never really had hair, but made sure my hair was, um, you know, tight, and my brass was shine, I, I was straight, you know, that's just, that's what you should be for an honor guard member, that's what you should be, really, I carried myself like that. So, this idea of unity and uniformity, so this is what came to my mind, so, like I said, I apologize if the illustration doesn't connect. <laughs> so, I was on the honor guard team, we had an honor guard assignment, I was in charge of that team when we'd go out to our assignments out into the community, and this one year we got assigned uh, to the Heritage um, Parade down in Middletown, Maryland. And so, you know, we was assembling the team, getting the team together, you know, make, looking at each other, you know, putting our, you know, belt on, making sure the brass looked right, because, you know, there would always be, you know, you know, county commissioners or mayors or the sheriff specifically would be there. Um, but we represented something bigger than ourselves. We represented the sheriff's office. And we always, you know, we carried the, you know, the American flag and the state flag, the county flag. I mean, if we had enough members on the team, sometimes other flags, and then two, like, old M1 rifles, just to make ourselves look strapped. And we started the parade out, and the parade was long, and so while I'm waiting for the members to get here. I'm looking at them, making sure we're all, you know, shined up, looking good, that we're going to be out into the public because we rep we're representing something bigger. Um, my heart was that we were going to be a united unit. We're, there's going to be unity there and not just uniformity, that we're going to be one team. Well, this honor guard assignment was, was nothing about unity, it was kind of about uniformity because one of the members that showed up was running late and he forgot his gun. So, you know, if you've ever seen anybody on our guests, we have the belts with all the, you know, different types of things. And so you have the holster. We, we dress just like the road patrol does, but just with Clarino high gloss stuff. And so there's a holster on your side and a gun goes in it. 
and you know, and for me, like I look at name tags and how's the brass been shined? You know, is there any kind of residue left from the stuff? You know, that's how you know is there creases in your pants? That's the kind of things that they look at as an honor guard member. <clears throat> and I'm looking at this guy like, you forgot your gun. And so in my mind, I'm trying to put together this team now because we're like half an hour from taking our step off. And I'm like, what in the world are we going to do? Like, that's going to be noticeable. That's a noticeable thing because those belts ride high and they see that. And, and normally he was the guy on the far right that held the old rifle. And how can we manipulate him around? And so <clears throat> this is the idea which we went for, which was the best thing we had. We, we have black leather gloves that we wear on patrol. And he decided to stick that glove in the holster and form it like a gun, like a handgun. I said, that's the best we got going. Do the best you can with that crazy glove in your holster. So he formed the glove, put it in his holster, <clears throat> because I was obviously the tallest one on the team. I usually carried the American flag, so I was somewhere close to the center. And then from there, the height goes down according to your height. He was a shorter guy, so he kind of always was on one side or the other. We had to manipulate him around to put him in there. So the most they could see was a shadow of black. That, you know, all the people sitting and close to the route, whatever. <clears throat> so, you know, as, you, as you're marching, you're you always press shoulder to shoulder. You press tight, and everybody leans kind of towards the center because what it does is it makes a straight line as you're moving. Step by step, you're in step. You can make turns. It looks very strapped or whatever. And we had a level of uniformity. We had no unity because the whole time I was mar we were marching, I was talking trash to him. His name was Anthony. You guys won't know him, so I'm... If, and he won't watch the recording, so. <clears throat> the whole time I'm like, Tony, I cannot believe, like, you're ex-military. You know, I was talking to him. Like, really, if anybody notices that gun and I get, or that glove in your holster, I'm going to get in trouble talking. And the other guys are smirking because we talk and, like, you know, try to keep ourselves in line and no one would kind of see that. We had no unity there. Zero unity in that, but we looked good, kind of, if, as long as no one looked too close to him. But how many times in the church does that happen? That we're trying to operate outside of what, you know, we, how many of us are, don't have a gun? We got gloves in our holster. We're just trying to get by. We're trying to pull it off. We're trying to make sure that, you know, that's this idea that he talks about here. See, there's a huge difference between unity and uniformity. You can pull certain things off. But if, if, we, if, if we were operating the way that we were supposed to be operating, there would have been unity through the ranks. Every, everybody would have been doing their part. Everybody would have been doing, you know, he would have had his gun. You know, I wouldn't have been frustrated with him. I wouldn't have been concerned, kind of sweating, sweating it as we were moving forward. You know, are we going to be able to pull this thing off? Are we going to be able to do this? If the sheriff sees this, he, he'll get in some trouble. I'm the one that's going to get in trouble. That's the difference between unity and uniformity. You know, I, I don't believe the church should be just simply trying to pull things off. I think that we should be united in spirit, as Jesus talks about here. You know, that we're not trying to simply uh, act, you know, try to, to try to mask something in our lives. We're just honest with each other. We share with each other. We do things with each other. And you look at that section, especially 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Paul says, you know, the hand can't say to the eye, or this person can't say to that person, I have no need of you. We all need somebody. The giftings that God has given me, the giftings that God has given Stephen or Jim or Connie or Tom or Nancy or Ramona, you know, or uh, any of us here are completely different. That's why there's diversity within this body. We all have different gifts. And the end result isn't necessarily ministry, even though that's what Paul says in, for, in Ephesians 4, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry to go out. And, and normally what comes to our mind in ministry is this idea of making disciples, getting converts, making the church grow. That's what we're called to do, yes. But before that all happens, when you read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, when, when you read Romans, Ephesians 4, all that through there, it's all about this body growing. The immediate body growing, the immediate body maturing, the immediate body operating in love. From that, ministry is going to happen. After we've spent some time like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet in Luke 10, the Martha part of our ministry will come about when we know Christ, when these gifts are in operation. So everybody in this room this morning has a gift or a set of gifts, talents that the Holy Spirit has given you if you know Christ and have been brought into the body by Him. By Him. You know, John, Jesus says in John chapter 13 this, because unity is so important, and unity can only come by way of love. Jesus says this, So now I am giving you a new commandment, 
love each other just as. And so there he defines what this love looks like in the same way that he defined in this prayer in John 17. What does this unity look like? What does this glory, what does this presence in the body of believers look like? It's going to be the unity and love that I have with my Father. That's what it's going to look like. Love each other just as I have loved you. You shall love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. He doesn't say, and when folks roll up in here in the storehouse on Sunday morning, uh, that this facility will prove to the world that you're a church, that you're part of the body of Christ. Your Bible reading, your devotional time, your whatever, this is the first thing that has to happen with this. If we're going to, if we're going to answer that question, is Jesus' prayer being pray, played out in our lives? This is the question. Is his love, remember Paul says, the love of Christ compels me to do the things that I do. Is his love seen in us? And that love that is seen in us has to be a love for one another. It has to be a love for one another. So how would I address, and I, I probably should have said something, I just was listening to this pastor talking about the frustrations of this older church and trying to shake the, you know, people out of whatever. It's like, you know, that's why Peter tells us love covers a multitude of sin. If you don't have unconditional love for each other, it's not going to cover the faults. Listen, I'm going to make you mad. I'm probably going to frustrate you. I'm probably going to forget things. <clears throat> and if I do, I'm not doing it deliberately. It's just what it is. So if you have unconditional love for me, if I have unconditional love for you, if you have unconditional love for the person sitting next to you, for the body here, what Jesus says is that unconditional love, that unity that you have for one another, now my prayers being answered in your life, and the world, when they look in, what they see, see what the world experiences is a conditional love. Conditional. The love that Christ is praying for here is that agape, that unconditional, no strings attached a love. For God so unconditionally loved the world. Because the world could do nothing for him. But he loved them unconditionally. See, the world love, like the world says, if you do this for me, or if you like me, or you go along with whatever, then I will love or like you. But if you don't do X, Y, or Z, then you know what, I'm out of here. But when the world begins to see what unconditional love looks like, when I offend you or you offend me, there's struggles, there's frustration, there's sin, there's whatever goes on in this body, Jesus' prayer then, I believe, can be, is activated in our lives. <clears throat> now I unconditionally love you no matter what. I love you in the same way the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, because now they're in me. Jesus says, that's proof. There's something supernatural going on there. It's unconditional love. So we'll kind of finish as we're going to roll down through this. So why is unity, this is the question I want to kind of just briefly answer and we'll be finished. Why is unity so important? Why is unity within the body of Christ so important? Like I said, we're not going to go into kind of, like I, I, I talked to you a couple weeks ago about job description. And what does the church look like? What's the body look like? We're not going to go into the specifics of that. Like I said, read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Romans 12, 1 through 21. Look at those things that... First, chapter 13 first. Because you can, none of those things will play out in your life. But why is unity so important? And this is a tough one to listen to. Listen to what God has to say about disunity. Proverbs chapter 6. You can kind of, you can kind of match Romans 16 to this because Paul re referenced disunity in the church. As a matter of fact, he says you need to mark the one that's causing disunity. But listen to what God says about it. Proverbs 6. This is pretty powerful stuff. Verses 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. It's not the writer of this book here. It's not the writer. This is what the Lord hates. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven, are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, listen to this one, and one who sows discord among brethren. One, six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. One who sows discord among the brethren. That's disunity. The one that is causing things to go wrong. The one that is, you know, actually, I was talking to Nancy, I think, at the beginning. We're just talking about, you know, that we're, we're just real with each other here. We all have struggles, and we were talking about just different sins. And, like, you know, you look at 1 Corinthians 6 and these different lists, Romans 1, and, you know, like, we don't look at people and judge them. You know, we love people. That's what we're called to do. We're called to love people, speak the truth in love. And, and um, like, one of them, that I think it was Nancy, or, um, 
I don't remember if it was Jan that brought it up, but gossip. You know, we, just, we talk about gossip a little bit. How quick can gossip cause disunity? You know, we, that's the one thing I think that we have to be on guard here at the storehouse. You know, I'm not concerned. I'm going to say I'm not concerned, but I'm not responsible for what goes on to the, at the church down here or at the church down here. <clears throat> My responsibility is right here. He, he gives shepherds, teachers, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, with the end result being to grow and to mature into his body, into the fullness of Christ, that we're tenderhearted with one another. That's what Ephesians 4 lays out. We're speaking the truth in love. You know, we're not grieving the Holy Spirit by the way we live. You know, I believe that when we are not united, when we are actually opposing Jesus' prayer, we grieve the Spirit. We grieve the Spirit. Because the Lord says He hates that. He wants the brethren to be united, to be together, to love one another. Because love covers, like I said, a multitude of sin. We're together. And for uh, the ultimate purpose behind all this is then that the world will know that you're my disciples. The second thing is this. Why is unity so important? The prayer that we looked at here in John 17, where Jesus says this prayer, verses 20 and 21, he also says it in verse 23, but verses 20 and 21, remember, this is what he says. I do not ask for these only, not for the apostles only, but also for those who will believe, that's me, you and I, in me, through their word, that they may all be one. This idea is unity, united together, just as, here's the definition, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us. This idea of united together with the head. This is a reason. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. There's something in our being united together, there's something in our love for one another that's going to testify to the world about who Christ is. They're going to test, it's going to testify to the world to something much higher, something that, that, that can transform a life. That's why it's so important, because the way that we operate here is going to testify to everybody that we come into contact with about the truth of who Christ is. We're going to close with this, and then we'll spend some time, a little bit of time in prayer here. So I like how, how it reads, actually, here in Hebrews chapter 13, 20 and 21, the first word, now. <laughs> with all that being said, with our identity in Christ being as one of his members, and we have a responsibility as a member, we have a responsibility to be united with one another, even though we're diverse in many areas. But that's a, really a diversity of gifts that we operate in love with the ultimate result of growing into Christ, being mature. Now, he says in Hebrews 13, may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, <clears throat> the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, and we give all the glory to him forever and ever. Amen. You see, we have a responsibility as part of the body of Christ. Now. <laughs> he's, this is the whole book of Hebrews. Now. Everything I've told you now. He's going to equip us. See, I, I'm not concerned with... I'm excited with what's going on here at the storehouse. I'm excited. I'm excited about stepping into the prison this afternoon to be able to share Christ with some ladies. I'm excited that now to sit in the back row and listen to Clark share Christ with us tonight and talk about his life experience as an older man talking about. I'm excited about those kind of things. Because, see, when we're excited about the things of Christ, when we're united together, when we're operating in love, unconditional love, when we're maturing together as his church, ministry is going to come from that. Because right there, the writer of Hebrews tells us that he's the one that is doing this. He's the one that's equipping us. He's the one that is doing this work in here. Let's just be honest with for, for all you that have been here uh, five years and back, would we be lying if we said Christ isn't doing stuff here? We'd lie. We'd be lying. We're here because of what God is doing in the life of this church. And as I look out here, you know, I look at a lot of the pews that are empty, I, but, I, but what I see is people that he's praying for right here, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me. Numbers don't necessarily matter. Really, do you know Christ? Are you united with his church, this body? I'm not talking about the structure. I'm not talking about pictures on the wall. Do you know Christ? Are you united in him? Are you growing in love? Do you love people? Is your love so evident that the world looks at you and says, I don't necessarily know what you're all about, but it's something that kind of draws my attention. 
And when that happens, you know, First Peter tells us what? That we can share Christ with them in meekness and gentleness, the hope that is within us. That's what the body is supposed to be all about. He went back. He's left us here to continue his work. And we're to be together, united in love. United in love. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, your word as it's laid before us is our instruction. It's our <clears throat> encouragement. It gives us direction. Lord Jesus, even as you prayed in here, you prayed, Lord, that we would be sanctified. Lord, we'd be set apart by your truth. Father, your word is truth. <clears throat> Lord, help us to be a, a body of believers here that stands firm on your word. That, Lord, we don't move to the left or to the right. Lord, we speak your word in truth. Lord, we realize even in your prayer here that the world may even dislike us because of that. But Lord, we don't seek the world's approval, we seek yours. <clears throat> Lord, we want to be a, a church, a storehouse community, a storehouse that has so much to give out to people because of what you've poured into us. Lord, we pray uh, for protection over us, Lord, that you keep us unified in one spirit because of one Lord and one faith. We pray that love would be an evidence in here. When people see us, they see love as a proof, Lord, that we are really your disciples. Lord, if there's a fault that we have with one another here, Lord, if there's something that's coming to mind, Lord, I pray that you give us courage to go to that person and just talk to them, to ask for forgiveness, to forgive. Lord, because the mission that you've given us is so important is to know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent, and then you've sent us out into the world to take that message to others. We thank you, Lord, for the unity that you're forming here in our fellowship. Lord, we thank you for the love that is seen here in our fellowship. We thank you for your life that is seen through us. We ask you to bless us, Lord. We ask you to draw us closer to you, united in your love, in Jesus' name.